Good evening to you all. Hello, my name is Sam Knights. I'm one of the founders of Shoot Festival, a very autumnal welcome back to our 2020 online festival. Amidst much uncertainty in our current situation, one thing that has been consistent this year is that the weather has taken a dramatic turn for the better in the southwest as soon as the schools have gone back after a characteristically Devonish August with gales, lightning and monsoon like rain. This is the first of our autumn events running until the end of November, and we're keeping the festival free and online for the remainder of the year in light of the continuing restrictions on gathering. So a huge thank you to you all for your support, including those of you who've made donations to help keep us going this year. I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening with Martin Hesp, writer, journalist and broadcaster. I can't think of a better person to have as our first speaker this autumn, synonymous as he is with this wonderful part of the world. Martin is joining us from an Exmoor Valley, and I'm sitting here amongst the rolling hills of Shoot. There have been some electricity outages today in Devon, I'm told, and so I hope those of you who uh, were affected are able to join us and that we're not felled electronically this evening at any point. Martin is a multi-award winning journalist. He spent over 40 years working in newspapers, radio and TV, and many of you will know him from his regular columns and articles for the Western Morning News, where he had the enviable position of editor at large for many years. I've been reading Martin's articles ever since moving to this part of the country and enjoying his incredible in-depth reporting of life, landscapes and his bashing of authority where required and his musings on the strange and wonderful stories and encounters of people here, which wouldn't otherwise find their way into national media. But we're here today to talk in particular about his new book, Tales from the Lockdown, which has had me immersed since I started it. And I should also say that I'm now in the middle of your novel, Martin, The Last Broom Square. So I hope if we've got time, we'll be able to talk about, a little bit about that um, too. The format for this evening is going to be, Martin and I will be in conversation for about 35 minutes. And then I want to open up um, the event for you all to ask questions and comments. So um, if you are not familiar with Crowdcast, you'll see on the uh, right hand side a column where you can say something nice. And it's wonderful to see um, Bob Bell from Oakland, California. Welcome to you all. We've got um, Jane from Exmoor and Michael from East Devon and Cynthia from Lyme Regis. So we've got a lovely collection of people from various parts um, of the world. At the bottom of the screen where it says ask a question, that's the column that you use um, to put in any question or comment, and I'll keep an eye on that um, box as we are going along. So, Martin, I wanted to start by um, asking you a bit about your background, how you got involved in journalism um, and where it all began for you. Well, he hello, Sam. And actually, just to explain about you were talking about the sunshine and it's sort of beaming in on me in my funny old hovel of a loft here um, inside Exmoor National Park. Ironic to have the sunshine sort of blazing in an, an English interview. But um, yeah, starting in journalism. Well, my dad was a journalist uh, all, all of his working career. And he was like me. He was a bit of an oddball. He didn't really like working in a big office. And he preferred to um, <clears throat> work from home. So when I was a little boy growing up, um, the clatter of um, his typewriter was the soundtrack of my infant life. And and um, I thought it was pretty cool because, you know, like I'm 64, um, was 64 last week. And so I'm talking quite a long time ago. And these are huge, big Underwood typewriters that were clattering away. But back in those days here in the countryside, this was in West Somerset where it still live um you know men and it was men were went to work and the idea that you work from home was odd no one worked from home our farmers did but they were out in the fields and so on but my dad was the only person in the school i went to the only dad who worked from home and of course we would chat a lot and um it always struck me from a very young age what what a an amazing job it was because he would 
tell me interesting things that he was writing about. And at a very early age, it occurred to me that if it was interesting, a journalist would be there. If it was boring, he probably wouldn't. Um, well, that didn't really count for some of the court cases and long council meetings, but that was the general gist of it. And it's been a theme all through my working life that, um, that a, a, a journalist in a community has a rather unique position, um, even compared to that of a doctor or a lawyer or a priest. Um, a doctor is going to see all of human life, but normally the not such good bit of it where people have problems, illnesses and so on. A lawyer sees all human life, but again, it's usually dealing with people when people have a problem. But a journalist is unique in that he or she sees all of it, the, the highs and the lows. I mean, the little local paper, and they still do, have the births, marriages and deaths section. And those organs of the, comedia, of, the, of the media, no matter how humble they are, deal with human life in, in all its ups and downs, highs and lows and extremities and dramas. So it seemed to me like the only job you could possibly do. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of pick up on on this sort of this kind of choice that you would have had and did have. You could have gone off to Fleet Street. You could have been, you know, based purely in London and for national media. But you made a very active choice, didn't you, to become really a, a, a West Country um, writer and journalist? Why? Why was that? Well, it, yeah, it wasn't quite like that, Sam, if I'm really honest. It, it, I, I began my career on the little local paper near here. Um, it's called the West Somerset Free Press, and um, it was a grand old paper in those days, and it was edited by a famous old boy called Jack Hurley, who's a legend in this area even now. And um, it... I only got that job because I went to the worst secondary modern school in, in the whole of the West Country, a place called Williton Secondary Modern. And it, I know for a fact, because I was told just after I left, that it had the worst academic record of any school in the southwest of England. It was really hopeless, to be honest. No one learned anything. And no one got any O-levels or CSEs or whatever. It was, it was just... The joke, really, and we all messed about. <laughs> and and um, it, we had great fun, you know, but we didn't do any work. And so I, I think I left there with one O level and had to scrabble around at Taunton Technical College to get a few more. And really, because of who my father was, he worked for the county paper, the Somerset County Gazette, and he had worked in Fleet Street, and he had an incredibly good name in journalism. On the strength of him being the Exmoor and West Somerset correspondent for um, uh, the County Gazette, they, they gave his son a job, I think, just knowing that he could keep an eye on me. And, um, and so I did it for about two years. And, and I, but I'd learned, the only thing I did learn at Wilton Secondary Modern School, I was the only boy who did typing because it was girls only, but I bullied my way into the typing. So I learned touch typing, which is unusual for a boy. And also I learned Pittman shorthand. Not Most people don't even know what Pittman shorthand is anymore. But um, so I learned those two things. So I had those two skills ready to go with um, when I got this job at the age of 17 at the, this newspaper. They would they were mean and they were desperate. And that's why they hired me. And and, um, and I sort of took to it like a duck out of water. I mean, I really just it didn't cause me any troubles. I was soon right in the front page. And that's not a big headed thing to say. I think I just picked up the knack from my dad, really. And um, but anyway, get back to your question. I'm sorry, I'm waffling on. But, uh, but it, I... There was a lovely sort of hippie artist commune near where we lived. And by then, my mum and dad had moved to a council estate in a little village called Williton. And it was 
a tiny council house really overcrowded and it was driving me mad and and i sort of ran off to live in this artist hippie commune and i fell in love with all the women there and did terrible things and eventually dropped out and and ran off to america and then amsterdam and finland and eventually ended up living in a sea cave in greece and all sorts of crazy romantic things like that and it wasn't for many years i just messed around all my 20s i messed around living all around the world um doing journalism just to just to as a freelance to just earn a crust somehow we were able to live on nothing in those days i don't know how we did it and then and then we had um eventually we're, we're living in this crazy old manor house back here in west somerset and um and my partner sue um you know we became parents with our son harry and i thought blimey i've got to take life seriously <laughs> gonna have kids and and um so i had to make a decision and i had been working for the guardian um for about five years and in fact they were my only paymasters for a number of years i worked solely for them writing big big feature articles and i i was sort of tempted to go and work in fleet street and and um, i had a good friend called valdemar yanushchak the art critic who who was very very lovely and helpful to me and um but I sort of thought, hey, I, if I'm going to bring up kids, I'm going to raise them in this beautiful, beautiful part of the world where I was born and bred. So I came to, to I stayed in my Somerset and, and raised um, my two children, Harry and Nancy. And so that was the conscious decision, really, uh, to be honest. And I was yeah. doing a bit of radio reporting and, and, and some TV presenting. And, and then one day, I got a job at the Western Morning News, and that was um, the start of 20 years of um, working for one of the great regional newspapers of all time. Yeah, so let's actually, I mean, I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about the um, the Western Morning News because it's such an important paper for the region. And by the way, if there are any teachers from your um, from your former secondary school listening in, you know, at least they can see what happened despite your terrible words about the school. You know, they must have done something. I have to tell you, and I feel relaxed because I happen to know they're all dead. <laughs> what a great advert for the school. <laughs> so, you know, so you, you had this incredibly plum job in, for, you know, in you know any respect of journalists as editor at large, which gave you immense freedom to write about a wide variety of matters, you know, about landscape, about people. Um, but it, I mean, really importantly, did allow you to write stories about the Southwest in a lot of detail, which wouldn't otherwise have been known about or reported on. But I, I mean, I wonder, you know, wonder what were what were your motivations really as as a journalist? Is it people you're interested in? Is it landscape? You know, what drives you as a as a journalist? Do you think? Well, one of the great things about the morning news was um, I started working there for a couple of years from 1999, actually, and as a freelance uh, and um, then the then editor, the wonderful Barry Williams um, uh, gave me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was to halve my earning, but give me a proper job. And I think I've got the contract here. It says, we're gonna make an honest man of you. And um, I don't know, um, he, he gave me a lovely job and I was able to sort of almost dictate my own terms. and. So one of them was um, Martin Hesp. I've, it is written here in this desk, actually. This contract says Martin Hesp shall never be expected to work from a company office. And, Bar and I had that put in, and Barry agreed with me. And he said, no journalist ever found a good story inside a newspaper office. They're all out there, the stories. You need to get out there and find them. And that's what I did. For, for, for And... I made it my business to just know everyone. And it's a huge patch. I mean, we're basically, for those people who are watching this from elsewhere, the Western Morning News, which is over 160 years old nowadays, uh, it's a real old grand lady of British newspapers, but it's, its patch stretches from just west of Bristol, right down to Land's End and to the Sillies. 
and um and then into West Dorset, down in the southeast, beyond East Devon, where you are. So it's a massive peninsula. And of course, as everyone knows, it's a beautiful and wonderful peninsula. It's the peninsula that everyone wants to go on holiday to, in, in the UK at least. Um, it's full of fabulous landscapes, wonderful people, dialects that to die for. I mean, the people I grew up with, the people I was surrounded by, I, I was reporting my own world to my own world. And it felt suddenly like a very important thing to be doing. And, yeah. and, and I've got to tell you, a really fun thing to be doing. And that, that was always crucial, crucial, crucial to me. It yeah. had to be fun. Um, I Look, sometimes I had to go and do... Uh, there, was, there was a wonderful news editor there who um was called ian mean <laughs> i loved him but um he's uh sort of uh smoke a cigar i think or i have this image he might not have done but i have this image of him smoking his eye and he'd ring me up and say um sb get out there and do something writerly will you and as long as i could do something writerly i was in business <laughs> and um <laughs> So even if it was a murder, we would go and find some angle that nobody else, all the nationals would be there. And so often I would be teamed up with my great friend, Richard Austin, the very famous Lyme Regis photographer. Yeah. And Richard and I, the adventure, I mean, we should write books about it. He's got all the images. Yeah. The adventures we had, um, just incredible, really. I mean, you, there are books and books worth of really extraordinary things that yeah. I mean we could we could go on all night and we haven't got time, but but we had a time of it. And I'll give you another example. I mean, I made it my business because I love the Isles of Silly. I made it my business to go there uh, to fly down there at least once every three months. At one time it was every once every couple of months. And I knew everyone on the islands and everyone knew me. And um I used to get terribly drunk and um, all sorts of crazy adventures. Wonderful. <laughs> so, so on this subject of knowing your patch really well as you do, I always remember the um, the London Daily Mail writer who bought a house on Exmoor and then created a book around her incredibly antagonistic relationship with the town where she lived. I mean, you're the very opposite of this, but. Are there or were there local stories which it was hard to cover as a local journalist because you did know the people and you were very embedded with the community? No, you, no there weren't stories. There was never a story. Uh, well, no, I'll tell you what, there was. There have been, yeah, thinking about it. I mean, this very valley I am sitting in was selected to be the epicenter of the very first badger cull and this place is remote let me tell you not very remote but it's quiet so there are people in the nearby village who don't even know this village this valley exists so we don't see anyone suddenly we had all these balaclava people coming up and down and police helicopters and one night my daughter shouted out the window of some abuse of 12 of these balaclava people because she thought they were um vandalizing my car and six of them came running up our garden path and i thought it's the only time i've ever rung 999 i thought we were about to be attacked actually they were running right past the house to try and go to a badger set up the hill they weren't interested in us but it was all weird and scary and, and tempers were running high um and it was very polarized uh, in that you were well i'm i'm I, I use that word polarized and I, I use it quite often, but I, I, a word I use even more often because it applies to me is the word ambiguous because I constantly find myself thinking, well, uh, what does it mean to me? I'm sort of pretty ambiguous about this really. I mean, that's how I felt about the, the badger cull really. I, yeah. I wasn't dreadfully angry one way or the other. I wasn't a farmer with cows, but around here, believe me, the tempers were running high. And I dipped my toe into opinion writing because that is also what I did a lot of at the Western Morning News. I mean, 
rent a mouth hesp you know they're hesp do us a thousand words on the badger call they anything you want it will be relevant bung it in um you know it had to be well written but so i dipped my toe into it and i got a few death threats from both sides <laughs> so, some there are a couple of things hunting is another one yeah I, I, I hunting i had uh, wrote about the the stag hounds on exmoor and i remain ambiguous i just these people do it these people don't want them to do it i'm just in the middle reporting all this stuff and richard austin and i went along for 12 weeks to cover the very last ever major scale stag hunts and they were extraordinary things to see he took a very world famous photograph of a huge stag launching across the road and knocking the huntsman off his horse i was standing a few yards away i thought the bloke was dead he wasn't he got up but it was an extraordinary thing to see but just writing about it saying hey this happened we went to see these these people doing this um i got quite a few death threats just for writing about it yeah. not for saying hunting should continue just as an observer yes and um you know i, I pick up the phone and say well, hang on you're going to come and kill me but you don't want people killing animals how come it's cool to kill me <laughs> you you know you can't win there are there are some stories you can't win on and no, no, no. Th those are two i let me yeah. warn you we'll have Sorry. complaints in a minute <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Well, we will hopefully have time to come back at, at the end to some of the yeah more sort of general questions about your journalism. But I wanted to kind of talk a bit about lockdown, not least because that's the subject of your short stories. You've been locked down in your lovely valley um, in Exmoor. But I mean, no doubt it wasn't all a bed of roses. And I mean, what was the impact on in terms of writing work for you? Was it difficult not being able to move around, you know, as a journalist, you know, all that sort of thing? If I'm honest, for me, it was a bed of roses. I had no problems at all because in in some ways I've always worked here, you see, from my contract saying I I didn't work from a company office. So I never went to a company office. I used to visit the Western Morning News HQ in Plymouth about once every two years. And that's how often I'd see my bosses. And um, so I've been socially isolating for 24 years up here, you know, in this cottage. So, and, you know, we had 10,000 acres to walk around in, you know. My son would ring each day from his flat in London, and I got the the real hemmed in feeling and my sympathies went to young families in cities mm -hmm. and not really to us in the countryside you know you can walk out in all that beauty out there it's not a big hardship um but there were you know i i tend to go to a local pub two or three evenings uh, a week just for an hour to see friends and of course that didn't happen so um that i missed that and then after a, i wrote a column about it actually um after a few weeks i realized that the people of exmoor at least and it might have been happening all over rural britain that everyone was developing a very loud way of speaking because people were coming up and down this valley shouting across the valley to each other and having these long distance conversations for 20 30 minutes well, they're standing 300 meters apart shouting across the valley at each other very safe distance um but as that went on very just within a week or two i thought to myself blimey you know i'm 63 i was then and i've never seen anything like this this is a really strange set of circumstances this is when you look at life through this very weird lens called a lockdown, people are behaving very differently. And I began to think of all the people I'd met and interviewed, um, must have been tens of thousands of them over the years um, across the West Country. I, I began to wonder about certain types of people and stories 
let's say, a, an illicit love affair. They happened all over the place. Well, they didn't have much in the lockdown because you weren't allowed to go meeting other people and so on. And and I thought, what would happen? You know, if you were having a, an illicit... So in that particular story, I, I, knowing the Somerset levels very, very well and knowing a couple of the steep-sided hills that are parked right next to the levels, I, I know one village that looks down. Now, if you were ha having an illicit affair in the middle of the levels, in the polders underneath that village, everyone in that village could see you if they were all at home. So this poor woman in this book, uh, she was she was really uh, fed up that uh, her affair came to an abrupt end. Anyway, and, and then there are stings in the tale of each story, I hope. Yes, I mean, I love, oh, there are stings and there are lovely twists at the end and, um, you know, all sorts. I mean, did you did you think about writing a novel? I mean, you obviously wrote short stories, but it was that was that something that you thought would be easier to write or you could get them out more immediately because you have previously written um, a novel? Yeah, and actually, um, before I wrote the tales from the lockdown, um, as the world went a bit weird, um, I wrote in six weeks uh, another novel called The Lemon Tree Forest, which is 110,000 words long. So um, it's a proper big novel. And I love, I'm really proud of it. And I'm just reading it through and editing it again now. Um, so the short stories are very, very much, a, it's, it's not like, oh, I mean, I can't make a story out of that. It's only worth a few hundred words. It's not like that. I, my feeling is, and and um, and maybe you were going to ask me about inspiration with short stories. And I'm a huge fan of Somerset Maugham mm. and of Guy de Maupassant. And if you, and you will know, if you look at their stories and and Somerset Maugham's in particular, they're absolutely filled with human frailty. In fact, they master on human frailty. And I think a short story is a better medium for that because if you've got an entire novel, which is all about someone's frailties, maybe some readers would love that. I would find it wearisome. I think, oh, for God's sake, go and see a psychiatrist or something. Do something about it. Get this fixed. Whereas a short story, one happenstance can change everything for someone and and bring out that frailty and what i noticed through this lens of the pandemic and the lockdown was that people's frailties were being amplified and magnified and it's pretty obvious that any stressful situation is if something is broke then it's going it ain't going to get better under stress it's probably going to get enlarged and i felt that the pandemic was doing that to people people i knew um people i could see stories i heard about through the grapevine and so i thought right i'm gonna have some fun here and i'm gonna pluck some of these ideas and frailties uh, out of the west country wind and put them onto this screen and write about them. And they suited short stories much, much better. Not one of those stories, I believe, could be elongated into a full novel. It just wouldn't have the legs. Yeah, and there's something very, um, yes, beautifully crafted about you know, these short stories because, as you, as you say, you don't, you don't want to expand them and the, and the, you know, the narrative is, is is all there and sort of deliberately um, shortened. I mean, I was very interested in you know in the in the um, last broom square. You focus a lot on the on the landscape of of the southwest. You know, it's very much set in you know a particular place. But the the focus of the short stories is absolutely on you know on the human condition. You know, which is you know the same focus that you get in a whole bunch of writers. You know, like as you say, Somerset Maugham and 
Guy de Maupassant and people like Chekhov and um, and you know and many others. And and I wonder. I mean, you, I, I'm sure you've borrowed enormously um, from people that you know, characters that you've encountered. Um, I mean, there is one particular type of character that crops up um, in a few of the stories, and that's the the journalist. This you know these stellar. I wonder very, why. You know. <laughs> Um, slick journalists. I mean, are those are those borrowed? You know, from people you know, from you. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, there are definitely a couple of stories there, where, um, which um, yeah, you could pay, you could probably pin them on on me. Um, certainly, one called I think it's called the Traveler's Rest, where um, a travel writer and I, I do a lot of, or ha did used to do a lot of travel writing. Um, and I hope to <laughs> return to it. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I did a lot, huge, amazing. The, just the adventures I've had um, uh, are based on my tra travel experiences around the world. And um, there's one story there about a travel writer. And he, I guess he is my age. I sort of thought of him as being an old bloke, but I suppose I'm an old bloke, but I never think of me as being an old bloke you know how people are and um he gets in a bit of a mess with a woman and um so that's not me because i'm happily married so. uh, but i can imagine that could happen to someone like me that particular story and um it, it's the only story where, where anyone goes to hospital because of coronavirus actually and because as you'll know having read it the book of those tales from the lockdown it, it's it's not about doom and gloom an illness so that's one thing i wanted to avoid it because we had so much of that on the news no one wanted to 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 read about oh i'm off to be on a ventilator and let me tell you about that and travel writing just while i'm talking about it um about 13 years ago i was in a jungle and uh, i went down a bat cave and and some leeches got all over my body and and what they did was sort of suck my blood, but they pumped bat poo into my system. There's a reason I'm telling you this. And um, and I came home and I got dangerously, dangerously ill. And I was carted off to Musgrove Hospital in Taunton. And they said, your white corpuscles are so high, you should be dead. We've never seen any You're breaking all world records here, mate. So that was scary. And, and uh, this this bacteria went to live on my heart and um, nearly killed me. But then they fixed, they drowned my heart with antibiotics for 10 weeks. And I survived to tell the tale, but it did do some damage to my mitral valve. And three years ago, I had this massive heart operation to fix my mitral valve. And it went wrong in the middle and I had to do it all over again. And so I was on the slab, operating slab for 12 hours and my lungs completely collapsed so for three or four days after that operation, I was on a ventilator, but the only way that they could get me to reinflate my lungs, and the only way to do that is to get the, the patient to reinflate their own lungs by breathing properly, was to keep me awake. So a lot of people with the coronavirus in, in the ICUs are, are put out into a sort of artificial comas because it's so horrible being on a ventilator. But I was kept awake on a ventilator. And let me tell you, those were the worst four days in my life by a million. I don't care what's going to happen in the future, but never be as bad as that. It was absolute hell. So when I started seeing people having troubles on ventilators you know, on the TV news, I, I thought to myself, and I had been told by a cardiologist, oh, don't worry, you're, you're fine. You don't need to worry about the coronavirus. You're a fit bloke. Um, because all they did was a bit of plumbing on my heart. Um, nevertheless, I thought, no, 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 no. I don't want to go back. I never want to be on a ventilator again. So I don't want coronavirus. Thank you very much. So, you know, my wife and I didn't go to a supermarket for 145 days. We did wow. take lockdown very seriously indeed. Let me let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's something which, you know, we can see in 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 the countryside in the southwest that you know people on the whole are taking it very seriously and taking the social distancing thing very seriously. Um 
I wanted to um, ask you actually about one of the themes which has come out in your um, your articles quite a lot and your you know writing um, overall as a journalist, but also which emerges um, in the um, in in at least one of the tales, which is about this sort of close quarter living between people from the town and the and and you know and, and country folk, and that's something which you can't you know one can't really escape. It's a subject which crops up all the time. I mean, have you witnessed and observed awkward situations in in lockdown between locals and, and non locals? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, really, really, um, you know, in the parish where I live, uh, because we're inside Exmoor National Park, there are, there are quite a few holiday cottages that are just used by wealthy, um, wealthy city people from London who come down and enjoy our beautiful countryside and, like, who can blame them? But, you know, they were shooting down here um, in that lockdown, um, whether they were meant to or not, I think... Uh, you know, I don't know, but they did, and 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 some local people got really angry about it. Um, you know, and country people are funny; they get really gruff and fed up, and they'll have a go at you between themselves. But they they don't really like being that confrontational. Most of them, actually. <laughs> so, um, but there is a story in there where, where which which uh, sort of evolves from that particular uh factor because there's a lot of things and we you know i didn't go to the supermarket we have a beautiful wonderful community-owned village shop here in the village of roadwater and the volunteers do a magnificent job and we've done a lot of shopping there right through this and they're brilliant but at one time when it was all looking a bit scary and when's the next delivery gonna come from you know, I went down there one day and, and someone said, oh, the bloke with the holiday cottage up there just came down and about eight eight people were staying with him. They all trooped in and they were buying the shop out and and that sort of, they didn't go down very well with, with, the, with the community. And, you know, the, I, I knew that that was happening all over. There was a famous chef in in. Cornwall, I think, no names mentioned, who who was taking a lot of flack for that sort of thing, and um, yeah, that's that's always going to happen, isn't it? Uh, holiday cottages are my favourite thing, anyway. When you see places that are empty all but for three weeks a year, when local people across the West Country, a lot of local people, have great difficulty finding. Place to live. I think that's one of the biggest problems that I ever saw as a journalist working across the West Country was rural poverty and a lack of affordable housing. So it's a, it, you know, that was a that was a little bit of a pressure cooker waiting to go off anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think if the lockdown had continued, it really heavily, it could have got worse. I think you know, I remember. I'm old enough to remember the sort of Welsh, and they used to have a thing, come home to a real fire as they burned your holiday cottage. And um, never happened in the West Country, not yet, but I thought it, it might do if, if, if the lockdown had continued. I wouldn't have been advocating it in my newspaper columns, but I would be observing it. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things which I think is beautifully observed in the story is also the sort of differences um, between sort of social classes and economic classes and something which, you know, again, in the countryside, you can't you, know, you can't escape because everybody is living in a much smaller community. Everybody wants to know who's in the community. And so, you know, whereas in a, maybe in a big city, you can sort of just, you know, not see certain types of people. You can just go about your business. That's not, you know, that's not the case in small villages. And that's a theme which emerges very much in your, your novel, The Last Broom Squire, you know, the relationship between the, the boy and then the girl of a, of a higher social class. But I mean, and that's something presumably, which again, is you know, you're very aware of. Um, not only really am I aware of it, uh, Sam, I'm, I'm sort of hugely proud of it uh, in that we can live like this. You know, mm. I remember going to the Valiant Soldier, which is our local village pub in Roadwater, and one night years ago, and there, there was a, a, a guy from the International Monetary Fund. There was a UN am, am, peace ambassador. There was a rabbit catcher. There were two agricultural engineers and me at the bar 
and we got on we had a fabulous evening all of us and that great melting pot is i've lived in the united states and i don't see it happening there and i've and i've lived in cities and it doesn't happen there because you just hang out with the people that you're close that you feel closest to here you, you you have to hang out with the people of the village and 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 i think this whole thing i saw i heard a program on radio 4 this week about the danger of of the present political state of the united states the 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 the, the, the thing that the present president had done which is to turn the people against government and so on uh, I, I just think that we've done it so well in this country. And I think country pubs are the icon of of leveling down or leveling up, whichever way you want to. But the rabbit catcher can stand next to the ambassador and have a damn good laugh all night long. And they, they love the experience, both of them. That's fantastic. And And if that goes, if anything ever threatens that, whether it's the pandemic causing the closure of rural pubs or other things, that would be a terrible, terrible shame. Yes, I mean, I think I think that's one of, as you say, one of the most, you know, one of the most many amazing things about the countryside is actually real diversity of people coming together. It may not always, you know, it may not be necessarily very ethnically diverse in a particular village, but you do have great diversity of of people meeting, as you say, all the time and getting along with each other. Um, we've got a question which I'm going to. Um, I want to put to you, and please do um, put questions for, for Martin in the box. This is from Harry, um, and Harry says, when thinking of the narratives of these short stories, how much influence does the West Country landscape have on the plots? Yeah, it does. Or well, Actually, in most of those six short stories, there's one uh, about a guy who walks right across on the two moors way right across um, the peninsula from dartmoor to exmoor and that's that story is just um a moving through the it's a it's a road movie it's a moving through the landscape story and i've already talked about the poor woman who couldn't have her affair anymore because she was being looked down upon from a, i mean that was all about the physical shape of the landscape and and um that was one thing that I really at the Western Morning News for the, anyone watching that didn't know, doesn't know the paper. I did a weekly walk for twenty years, and I really did them. And what I learned about from doing that was that that the geography. I mean, geography. The, it's just a word, but actually, when you do that many walks in one vast peninsula you begin to see how the whole of the terrain locks in like a huge jigsaw puzzle and you you work out that you're in one valley system that leads into another and so on and it i find i find that fascinating that sense of place is everything uh to me um i know people who are born and bred with no sense of place at all it's and I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but for me, a sense of place is just everything. And, you know, I, I do actually feel the landscape um, in my everyday life. Uh, I could never live anywhere that was ugly. I just couldn't do it. I, I wouldn't be able to survive. It sounds a stupid thing to say, but it's true. <laughs> And I think I think you um you came quite close to shoot in one of your walks. Um, in fact, you got I think you went to Seaton, um, which is our nearby beach. And so maybe we can entice you um, at one moment to a shoot walk at some point. Um, but another question um, um, we have: What about um, the the device of you know plot? You know, you think one thinks about you know the seven basic plots that you know people use rags to riches stranger comes to town you know when you were constructing your stories did you think a lot about whether there needed to be a sort of conventional plot before you no. wrote no. no i'm i'm hopeless at convention in anything i was an unconventional journalist i've been an unconventional father husband everything else i'm absolutely totally unconventional I'm absolutely use i mean i just never think that i just just you know, walking with my dog Finn, which I do every day, 
through this landscape and seeing people shouting across the valley during the coronavirus lockdown, I was just uh, walking along thinking, hang on, what if that bloke had to walk right across the peninsula? What if a travel writer came home and suddenly he was in lockdown and he'd been living in five-star hotels all year long, all his life for years, and suddenly he was in a little cottage he couldn't even go out the garden gate you know it's 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 all about and, and you can get away with it with short stories because you just say what if and then you do the story and 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 then i think it's it's good if you can play around go on another dog walk having half written it because these stories i'd write in two days you know and i do write fast and you, you're on the next dog walk, you've written half of it, you think, well, hang on, how's this going to end? Um, what if we put a little bit of a twist in here? What if? And, um, you know, actually one, one day I was walking down the road and I saw a person who had a holiday cottage and she happens to be famous. And I thought, ah, I've just got the end of one of the stories sorted. So you know, I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I. I would hate if if I went to a some sort of writing course and a lecturer says, "Come on, Martin, you know, sit up and take notice. You've got a which sort of plot lines this going to be?" I'd say, "Why? Well, I don't. Life doesn't run like that. Just like you won't find stories in newspaper offices. You've got to get out there and find them." What's been the reaction from the media community? Have some of them recognised themselves? I mean, obviously you've had great reviews on um, on Amazon, but what about the people immediately well, around? I, I honestly, I did. Yeah, I, I know. I'm. You know, I've only. I know I've only got one O level, but I'm not that daft, and I have disguised them pretty well. I think I've not had any complaints saying you bugger. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. It's that. There's a writer at the beginning of the book. You, as a lawyer, should have read that, saying that all the characters are in there are um, fictitious. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, another question, actually, about um, about sort of you know media coverage of the um, of the pandemic um, this time. So there's, I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of mainstream media, national media coverage of the pandemic. You know, such as Radio Four and the Today program being very gloomy and focusing on sort of you know on the you know the death toll, et cetera. And people you know, did get scared and it's very palpable here. But I mean, what's your view of the media coverage of, of, of the pandemic, either nationally or, or locally? I, I really have no complaints about it at all. And I'm astonished when I see people complaining about, oh, you're overly gloomy. I listen to the Today programme every morning being being congenitally lazy i don't even get up till nine o'clock so i lie in bed listening to it and i think it's been really good and i think the reason i'm absolutely convinced that when the strict lockdown was on in full force britain took notice of it and 99 percent of the british did because of those amazing news reports on bbc and itv which showed reporters going into um, intensive care units and the horror of it. And, um, you know, if you, if you really are telling me that that you can be, I know you're not, but but the people who criticise uh, are saying, oh, they over-dramatise it. No, I don't think so. I think I've been on one of those ventilators and I don't. there's no way you could over-dramatise it. If there's a disease sweeping through the populace that is going to put 45,000 people or kill 45,000 people and put a lot more on those machines, dramatize all you want. I mean, living in this remote valley, and, and you touched on this earlier, and the difference between town and city, perhaps, is that when eventually I sort of went out of the valley, and I have to go out of the valley to see my mum in mine head who's not very well and you know mine had seafront just after the lockdown ended proper well it lockdown what lockdown pandemic what pandemic it was just you know journalists get trained to count crowds 
And one day, I reckon there were 4,000 people on that promenade. And none of them were wearing masks. None of them were social distancing. And okay, now it's proved that if you're in the fresh air, you're probably going to be all right. But I drove down that seafront because I was on my way to my mum's with all the windows up and the vents closed, thinking, blimey, what's going on? You know, you do get a bit extra paranoid when you, when you don't see anyone. You learn to be scared more. Whereas my son is looking out of his window in Clapham saying, Dad, there are 4,000 people just un under my window, let alone, you know, um, it's, it's a different world. And you get used to different things, don't you? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I found myself, the, the well, there were, there were me and four kids at the swimming pool the other day, and it, we were the only people in an enormous pool. And it was, it was actually very scary. And I, I asked, where is everybody? But you know, hopefully they will start coming back. Um, We've got time for a few more questions. So if anybody does want to ask um, Martin a question before we end, please um, put it in now. But I, I wanted to um, ask you about the um, about the sort of, if you like, the aftermath and the, you know what we might get out of the pandemic and how it's changed attitudes. Because I mean, in the southwest, you know, things like climate change are very keenly felt with flooding and you know wet and warm winters, dry summers. I mean, do you think? We are going to change habits, or you know, or go back to the way we've been living before. Are we going to buy locally going forward, or just slide back into supermarket mode? What's what's your sense? What does it look I like? Lo I'm an internal optimist, and I, I would love to think we're going to buy locally more and and rely on our village shops more. But for once, I'm going to be a bit pessimistic in answering this because uh, you know, people. You only had to see it once that strict lockdown was done. You know, here on Exmoor, we are right under a couple of the main air lanes in and out of Heathrow uh, to North America and the Caribbean also. I know all this because I've been this guy. You know, I'm the worst jet traveler. I mean, I'm, I'm the man who's to blame. You know, I've got more air miles than it's ridiculous. So I... I feel wrapped in guilt about this, but you know, often the sky goes dark here because there are so many vapor trails, literally because of the air traffic coming in and out of London, Schiphol, and the other airports that use these airlines. And then for what three months we had clear vapor trail free skies. It was just extraordinary. And also the quietness. We we're also under the uh lane for Bristol and Cardiff airports here and so they're using a lot of uh, energy taking off and we get a lot of so those are an incredibly peaceful place to live we do get a lot of jet noise in normal times and suddenly it was quiet for three months and when they started taking off again I'd be sitting here in this office saying what the hell's that <laughs> you know is that the, an F-111 scorching over and no it was a 1230 to Malaga, you know, and um, it's all coming back really quick. I just before we had this talk, I took my dog out for a walk and I saw two discarded face masks here in the middle of nowhere, you know, on a quiet country footpath. And you think, oh, blimey. And um, yeah, all those disposable masks and disposable this. And I went and had a heart scan the other day, and the nurse, bless her heart, she had more disposable plastic gear on than you could wrap the Eiffel Tower in. And I said, what well, is all going to happen to all that? Oh, it's all going in the bin. You know, and you think, yeah, right, there we go. Um, it was doing well, the old lockdown, but um, we're back to our evil old ways again on the environment. And we've got us... I was just writing my column for Saturday's newspaper and a guy who's joined us, Bob Bell from California, had written me this beautifully written email about the orange skies he is see seeing out of his window thanks to the forest fires. Um, in my column that will appear on Saturday, I've said the coronavirus pandemic seen from some angles is a wavelet crashing onto the rocks when the storm of climate change is there on the horizon bearing down on us fast i really fear that is true mm -hmm. 
On that note, and I think this will um, this will be the last question we've got time for. A question from Bob um, Bell: Any chance of the Broom Squire becoming a movie? Bye bye. Um, oh, good old Bob. I love your support, Bob. Well done, mate. Um, actually, you're in California, mate. You go pop down to Hollywood and have a word with some of those people. Now, actually, a British filmmaker approached me and took away loads of copies of it and was absolutely determined. She said, this is made for movies. We're going to make a movie. Of it. And after a few emails, never heard anything again, which is the story of my life. I'm desperately keen to find a publisher for the lemon tree forest, but uh, I imagine the rejections will flow in as healthily as normal. And um, there'll be no change there, which is a pity because I'd a lot of people, we sold three and a half thousand copies of the broom squire. Uh, when after James Crowden published it, and the one comment I keep keep getting from people is, it's got to be a movie. So it would be wonderful if it ever is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really, really loved, um, really loved. Well, I'm loving the book. I haven't finished it yet, but it's just a beautifully very different to your short stories, but beautifully crafted. You know, historical. Um, fiction but based on a on a true story on a very very bizarre true story um and i won't i don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it um we are going to have to wrap up but i before we go first of all i want to remind people these are these books wonderful books um and they're both available um, and published um on amazon so um please do go and um, get hold of copies and the proceeds um from tales of the lockdown are all going to hospice care um very generously so it's a really really good thing to support as well and um i have to say martin you very generously waived your speaker fee and we are donating that to um hospice uk too so thank you um for that um and before um, we say goodbye, I just want to remind all of you who have joined us this evening, we've got the wonderful Polina Shepherd um, here next Friday at six o'clock with a sing-along of Russian and Yiddish folk songs and a concert. So join us for that. You don't need to be able to sing, nobody can hear you, um, and you don't need any Russian or Yiddish um, either. So you've got no excuse. Um, and then we have Susan Owen speaking about her new book, Spirit of the Place, on the 24th of September. All details on the website and via our mailing list. So it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to you, Martin, for amusing and enlightening us um, this evening and um, to you all for um joining us um people who weren't able to get to us this evening will be able to find this on our youtube channel um shortly after this evening so thank you all very much and good evening bye-bye